Korra's first appearance lets us know exactly who she is. I'm the Avatar! You gotta deal with it! At the beginning of her story, she was on top of the world, and with bright eyes she viewed this new world. Korra was in constant contact with the legendary Katara. Surely she heard about all of the stories of the Avatar, and precisely how the Avatar was desperately needed before the world went up in flames, literally. And so Korra had those same dreams and that same desire. She bent three out of the four elements as a kid and trained and mastered in those three bending styles by 17 years old. A prodigy destined to be the avatar with a desire to be needed, just like her past lives were. Korra's identity became rooted in her role. Without the avatar, there was no Korra. She didn't want to just have fun and be a regular kid like Aang, no. Korra wanted, yearned even, to be the Avatar. Korra was gifted and she worked equally as hard, and so she took pride in her abilities. Pride isn't a bad thing, but pride without humility leads to arrogance and overconfidence. Korra was headstrong, brash, and stubborn. Though a waterbender by blood, she had the spark and the passion of a firebender. To add to that, Korra's upbringing as the Avatar was different than all the others. Usually the Avatar travels the world, learning the elements from the Four Nations, and finding teachers there. But in her case, all of her teachers were right in front of her, and so Korra didn't need to travel the world. She didn't even need to leave the Southern Water Tribe. I believe the lack of travels hindered Korra's outlook on the world, as travels to the Earth Kingdom teaches responsibility and stability, and the Fire Nation teaches one how to control their own power. And finally, the air nomads and airbending would teach spirituality, poise, and restraint. In short, the travels around the world gave the Avatar perspective on what exactly the world needed. It gives the Avatar a little bit more compassion. Again, Korra's life is predicated on her bending and on her strength. And as she encounters someone who can strip her of this power, fear creeps in on the young Avatar for the first time. And as Amon took her bending away, Korra lost her identity. Korra was broken, but slowly she recovered. A season later, she lost her connection to the avatars by Unalak, and so she was broken spiritually, but she recovered. And with each of her foes, they reiterated the one thing that Korra never wanted to hear, that the avatar wasn't needed. And in the third season, she faced what would be her second strongest opponent, the Red Lotus. The Red Lotus challenged Korra's identity as the Avatar once again, and in that final episode against the Red Lotus, the Water Tribe Avatar took part in a rather brutal fight. This time she was broken physically, but what we would find out is that this time she didn't recover. Through Korra alone, we saw that Korra suffered from depression and post-traumatic stress from her battle with Zaheer. Korra was fighting off hallucinations of her former self, dealing with mental illness that felt inescapable. And for three long years, she would be haunted by her former self. In her dreams, in reality, it was everywhere. She was fighting off the fear that she wasn't needed, the fear of her dying in that battle, and fighting her own growth. She was at her lowest point. This was the avatar who was once on top of the world, whose bright eyes were now so dulled. Korra has always been physically imposing. Her lifelong training is showcased in her design. This is a muscular girl. But now look how depleted she is. Korra wasn't eating, she wasn't sleeping, and she couldn't train. She was depressed, and this was the outcome. Korra looked like a shell of her former self. But as she slowly overcame her depression and her inner terror, as she began to rely on others, the fully realized avatar thrived and prospered. And with a happy heart, I saw the Korra that I waited four seasons to see. One who knew that even if the world didn't want her, the world would always need her. Because without Korra, Kuvira wouldn't have been stopped. Throughout the entire show, her existence is constantly questioned. The role of the avatar isn't what it was in years prior. The world isn't clearly up in flames and needs desperate saving. Her role required from her a little more nuance and compassion and less ferocity. A world perfect for Aang, but this is Korra's legend. Korra started off her journey as headstrong, brash, hot-headed, and sadly a little bit happier. 
before, Korra never wanted to be diplomatic. She never wanted to hear other options play out. She wanted to resolve problems through bending and through her fists. Aggression has been what she has trained for her entire life. Again, down to her design, she is powerful. Korra is built to fight, whether it be the Fire Nation or a battle with Ozai. But that's not what her role demanded from her. Imagine you spend your whole life working towards being the Avatar, only to be attacked and told time and time again that you aren't needed and frankly you aren't wanted either. What does that do for Korra's sense of self, for Korra's identity? Who is Korra? It took three years for Korra to figure that out. It took Korra three years to figure that she is a mature, compassionate, and understanding individual, but she is also strong and fierce and she will always be, but she needed to find that balance. She needed to become a little more human. And one aspect of Korra's tenure that needs to be respected is the resiliency it takes to go from avatar to human, to watch those you love lose confidence in you, to have your identity stripped away from you and to be broken physically, mentally, and spiritually. The resiliency it takes to have all the power in the world, but to feel powerless against your mind. And finally, the resiliency it takes to heal. Korra has suffered time and time again, season after season. Her journey is suffering. But after each battle, Korra stood on her own two feet and kept going. That is someone who is strong. Korra, with the aid of all of those against her, instructs us about the realities of the world and about adversity, and that even if the world is against you, you can and you will make it through. Up to this point, Korra was a character in the series that hadn't been seen. Korra's story was sad, but in order for her to become in tune with the world, she needed to suffer. It's hard not to compare Aang and Korra, as they are the same people spiritually but could never be more different. The fiery Korra and the peaceful Aang. However, Korra choosing to spare Kuvira in that moment and in the time after, she would become the spitting image of the young air nomad, as she showed restraint and compassion that the former Korra would never have shown. Compassion that Aang would have been so proud of. Korra doesn't end the series the way she was at the beginning. Everything wasn't magically okay. As I once said, her healing didn't begin and end in Korra alone. It was a process, and it is a process. It was heartbreaking for me to see that she wasn't as bright-eyed as she once was. Through the final ceremony, you could see it on Korra's face. This is a girl who has been through so much. And in her eyes, you can see the fatigue. But later through those same eyes, you can see the joy that Asami brings to Korra. Korra was just a teenager when she sacrificed her body and her mind for the world. Through suffering, she lost her innocence, but gained maturity and balance. Water is the element of change. The people of the water tribe are capable of adapting to many things. They have a sense of community and love that holds them together through anything. The Avatar will always be needed, and through her little community, Asami, Mako, Bolin, Tenzin, the Beifongs, and everyone else, they all remind her of that. Look at Korra when she began, and then look at Korra in the end. Korra embodies resiliency and growth. 